Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Tayo po ay nagbabalik sa ating sermon series sa uh, libro na pinamagatang Taking God at His Word by Kevin Leang. Huwag po sana kayong masyadong malito kasi masyadong mahaba yung lagtaw ng ating sermon series. Parang laging end of the month. So, just to give you a review, yung last na pinag-usapan po natin about this sermon series is about knowing what to believe feel and do about the Word of God. So last time we, did, we discussed that we must believe that the Word of God is true. And then we must also believe that the Word of God demands from us what is right. Wala namang hiningin kahit ano ang salita ng Diyos sa atin na ikasasama natin. And then we should also believe that the Word of God provides what is good for us. And then after that, we also discussed about what we should feel about the Word of God that we should delight about the Word of God, that we should desire the Word of God, and that we should depend on the Word of God. And then lastly, we talk about the things that we have to do to the, work, to the Word of God. So alam natin, marami yun. We should study the Word of God. We should meditate the Word of God, sing the Word of God, store the Word of God in our hearts. So now, meron na lang po tayong panibagong topic na about pa rin sa salita ng Diyos. Ngayong hapon, Manadaman natin kung, gaga, kung gaano ka-certain, ka-sure ang salita ng Diyos. That's why we can trust the Word of God. Yun nga lang po, ngayon ko lang napansin na yung title ng aking sermon ay nagkaroon ng kama sa gitna. Ang title dapat talaga nito is Something More Sure. Kasi yan yun eh, may exclamation point sa dulo. Kaso nagkaroon siya ng kama between more and sure. Kaya kung babasahin nyo siya, parang something more. Sure. Pero hindi ganun yung ano ah. Hindi ganun yung title ha? Ang title talaga nito is something more sure. At yung something more na yon, na sure, we are talking about the Word of God. Before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather together every Sunday to study about your Word, to be refreshed by your Word. Father, we pray that you guide us this afternoon, give us humble hearts. Itago mo rin po ako sa iyong likuran. May you override all of my preparations. And may this message this afternoon benefit your people so that we will be able to trust your word about anything else. Maraming salamat, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, so let's begin. So, since we are talking about the word of God, Alam ko naman, uh, marami sa atin dito ay hindi naman mga bagong kristyano. Malamang yung iba sa atin ay galing na sa evangelical at dumating na tayo dun sa stage ng ating pananampalataya kung saan on fire na on fire tayong mag-share ng Word of God. When I was still in the charismatic church before, nung papaalis pa lang ako, naalala ko dahil sa panunood ko ng mga preaching ni Paul Washer, sobrang on fire na on fire ako na mag-preach ng gospel. To the point na every rest day ko, kasi call center ako before, every rest day ko, nagja-jogging ako sa Garden of Memories. So, isa siyang cementerio na doon sa Pateros, kung saan maraming nagja-jogging. And then, every after uh, I jog, pag may nakita akong mga tao, nag-share ako ng gospel kahit at least isang tao lang bago ako makauwi. Pero alam natin that when we share the, the Word of God, hindi natin may iwasan na meron tayong may encounter na critical thinker o kaya skeptic. Okay? At kapag kamalas-malas mo at ang nasiran mo ay critical thinker o kaya skeptic, meron silang madalas na tatlong tanong na pwedeng ibato sa iyo. At ano yung mga tanong na yun? Unang-una, share ka sa akin ng share ng gospel, but how are you sure that the Bible is really the Word of God? Paano mo nalaman? Paano ka ganun kasigurado? Pangalawa, E eh, di ba yung mga nagsulat naman ng Bible, lahat naman yan tao? So, if the Bible is written by men, then how are you sure that whatever is written in the Bible is correct at walang mali doon at walang nakadepende lang doon sa opinion ng mga writers na yun? And then lastly, how can you say that the Bible is the Word of God when it is full of contradictions and errors? So, kapag tayo ay bago-bago sa pananampalataya at nakaharap ka ng mga ganyan tanong, minsan tayo ay, tayo ay natatameme. Lalo na kapag first time nating na-encounter yung ganitong mga question. But, the worst thing is, 
These kinds of questions we do not only receive from skeptics and um, critical thinkers, but sometimes we also ask these questions ourselves. At kailan natin tinatanong yung question na yun? When we are confronted by the Bible to give up a particular sin. At kapag yung sin na yun ay gustong gusto natin, napupunta tayo dun sa dilemma na sino ba ang susundan ko? Yung sarili ko o yung Bible? At kapag pumunta ka na sa ganung dilemma, you will ask the same question. Tatanungin mo sa sarili mo, why do I have to give up this sin? In the first place, is the Bible really the Word of God? O lahat ba talaga ng nakasulat sa Bible ay salita ng Diyos? O may iba lang dyan na salita ng Diyos? At yung iba naman ay hindi? And it just so happened na yung dinitiman sa akin ng Bible is not really something that is said by God in the past. Pwede rin nating tanungin na, what if yung Bible talaga isulat lang talaga ng mga tao yan? At yung mga tao nagsulat ng Bible, may kanya-kanyang preference. And it just so happened that Apostle Paul does not agree with what I want to do with my life. Lalo na, if you are a woman who is aspiring to become a pastor, tapos nakita mo si Apostle Paul, I do not permit a woman to teach. Oh, baka naman opinion lang ni Apostle Paul yan, pero hindi naman talaga yung word of God yan. So we ask those questions as well. And then, sometimes, we also think, what if the Bible is really full of errors? At yung dinidiman sa akin ng Bible na i-give up ko na kasalanan, ay hindi naman talaga kasalanan, kundi it's an error by the Bible itself. So, napakahirap na mga tanong ito na kailangan nating i-deal kaagad, as soon as possible. But these questions are not really new questions. Because the attack on the Word of God started in the Garden of Eden. So, it is the oldest trick that is in the sleeve of the devil. Kasi kapag ang devil gusto niya napabagsakin ng isang believer, he will cut you in the knee. At ang kailangan niya lang gawin is to destroy the basis of your faith. And the basis of your faith is the Bible. That's why, ang tanong ng serpent kina Adam and Eve is that, did God really say that you cannot eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil? So, ang titirahin kagad niyan ay talaga bang sinabi to ng salita ng Diyos? At kapag naisahan ka dyan ng devil, wala na. Talo na yung laban ng sa dulo. And up until now, this question is being asked by us, not only by skeptics, not only by critical thinkers or ourselves, but it is also asked by cults, by cult leaders. Ang ginagawa nila is, hinahanapan nila ng butas ang Bible so that kapag nawasak nila yung credibility ng Bible, they will be able to introduce their own special revelation. That's why kapag nakakausap po kayo ng mga Mormons, ang sasabihin nila sa inyo ay yung Bible dahil sa paulit-ulit na translation niyan, na mali-mali na yung translation niyan, kaya corrupted na yan. Hindi mo na malalaman yung original meaning niyan. That's why, introducing the Book of Mormons. So, ganun ang gagawin nila. The same thing with the Quran, with the Islam. Sasabihin nila sa iyo, oh, the Bible, that's already corrupted. And we need a new source of divine revelation, which is the Quran. At hindi natin namamalayan, even in the charismatic and Pentecostal circles, nakakaroon din ng mga ganitong klase ng issue. Pero, eto naman, medyo mild, pero ang sasabihin sa atin is that, if you limit your knowledge on the written word of God, you will be missing a lot of blessings. Kasi dapat ngayon, naririnig pa rin natin yung audible voice of the Lord. Kaya dapat, makinig ka dun sa still small voice. O kaya sa revelation ni God doon sa pastor, o kaya sa propeta na in-invite sa church. So these are very, very crucial questions that we need to answer. But the good thing is, this question has been encountered before by Apostle Peter. Doon niya po natin yan mababasa sa 2 Peter 1.16-21. to Pero dito naman sa 2 Peter 1.16-21, to what is being attacked here? specifically, is the second coming of Christ. Okay? It's the second coming of Christ. So, tatanungin natin, bakit naman kailangan atakihin ng mga false teachers ang second coming of Christ? Malalaman po natin yan if we will look at the context of the second epistle of Apostle Peter. Okay? Kung titignan po natin yan, yung chapter 1 ng epistle ni Apostle Peter is actually 
an exhortation to godliness. Gusto ni Apostle Peter na yung mga believers, they should be holy. They should be godly. At yung godliness kasi na yun is an evidence of their election. Kaya kailangan natin yung ipakita. So, godliness is the premise of our calling and of our election. At nagpakita si Apostle Peter ng mga patterns of godliness and virtues that should be added to faith. But then, sa chapter 2 ng 2 Peter, makikita natin doon that Peter is concerned about some false teachers who are creeping into the church, promising freedom from the bondages of the scriptures so that the people of God will end up leading themselves into sensuality and spiritual bondage. So yun yung naging concern ni Apostle Peter na ine-exhort ko nga yung mga people of God to godliness eh. Pero may papunta naman mga false teachers na gusto namang i-corrupt yung utak ng mga believers. And then, ano yung naging exhortation ni Apostle Peter for the people of God to pursue godliness and to ignore false teachers? The greatest motivation is the second coming of Christ. Yun yung laging ipinapaalala ni Apostle Peter sa mga believers nung panahon niya. That one day, the Lord will come again. That's why you have to pursue holiness and you have to forsake wickedness. Pero syempre, alam naman natin, mga false teachers, makukulit yan. So ang gagawin nila is, the motivation that was given by Apostle Paul to the believers in his time was attacked by the false teachers. At paano inatake yun? Ang sabi ng mga false teachers is that this expectation of the parusha or the second coming of Christ is merely a cleverly concocted myth. It's just myth. Ano pang ibig sabihin ng myth? Gawa-gawa lang. Mga, masa, ang tawag dito sa Tagalog, ito ay mga alamat lamang. Mga gawa-gawang kwento. At hindi lang basta gawa-gawang kwento. Kundi ang sabi pa nila is, these are cleverly concocted myths. Meaning to say, talagang pinagplanuhang kasinungalingang istorya para map- mapasunod yung mga believers sa panahon ni Apostle Peter. Now, because Apostle, Apostle Peter wants to defend the doctrine of the second coming of Christ, he presented two types of evidence. Two types of evidence na may kita pa rin natin sa legal practice. Those two types of evidence are first, I witness testimonies and second, authoritative documents. It's the same kind of evidence that we use in court. Dalawa lang yan. It's either we will present eyewitnesses, ilalagay namin sa witness stand, or magpapakita kami ng documentary exhibits. And now, sino yung mga eyewitness na pinepresent ni Apostle Peter? Walang iba, kundi siya. Yung sarili niya at yung kasama niyang mga apostles. At yung kanyang account ng kanyang eyewitness testimony is about what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Ay, nabulol ako doon. The Mount of Transfiguration. At mababasa natin yon sa 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. So let me read. Sabi ni Apostle Peter, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. So ang sinasabi ni Apostle Peter is that they are eyewitnesses of what happened in the Mount Transfiguration. So, hindi na masyadong in-specify ni Apostle Peter dito na nakita niya rin si Moses on the right and then si Elijah on the left. But ang nakita niya dito is that there Jesus Christ was clothed with glory that no one has ever seen. And they have heard the voice of God saying, This is my only begotten Son in whom I am well pleased. That is the eyewitness account of Apostle Peter. But syempre, tatanungin niyo ko, Brother Ed, akala ko ba yung eyewitness account na ito ay is in defense of the second coming of Christ? Now, 
what is the connection of the transfiguration to the second coming of Christ. Let me present to you the connection. Ang connection po niyan is that the very words na sinabi ni God the Father when He spoke on the event of the transfiguration is actually an allusion to Psalms 2, 7 to 9. Okay? To Psalms 2, 7 to 9. Ulitin ko lang yung sinabi ni God the Father. Ang sabi niya, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now, if we are going to go to Psalms 2, 7 to 9, ang sinasabi doon is that, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay? So kung titigan po natin, pag binasa natin yung Psalms 2, it's about the proclamation of the coming king and the judge of the whole world. And that is Jesus Christ. So may kita natin, itong Mount of Transfiguration, it's not only to show off the power of Jesus Christ to his disciples so that they will believe, but this is actually a declaration of the appointment of Jesus Christ as the judge and the ruler of all nations. However, this role is something that is not yet exercised, what will be eventually exercised in the future on the second coming. So that is the connection. So yung transfiguration pala na yun is the appointment of Jesus Christ as the judge of the whole world. That's why we can conclude that someday in the future, Jesus Christ will come again. And that is the second coming. And at that time, He will be judging the whole world. That is the eyewitness. And this only shows that Christianity is based on history. Hindi ito katulad ng sinasabi ng mga Gnostics na, ah, hindi, yung Christianity, it's all about myths. Mga alamat lang yan. Or sinasabi ng mga skeptics today na, how can we believe the Bible? Eh, mga nakasulat dyan ng mga story is about a talking donkey? O kaya yung sea na bumubuka? O yung ten plagues? All of those are like fantasies, fairy tales. But that is not the belief or that is not the stand of Apostle Peter. Christianity is rooted on historicity. And the great claims of Christianity stands and falls on history. That's why, ang sinasabi ni Apostle Peter, these things did not happen at a corner. Yung pagpapakita ni Jesus Christ when He rose up from the dead, it was seen by almost 500 people. This is a historical account. And that is something that we should not give up. But the problem is, we no longer have any eyewitnesses today. Tama ba? Because all of the apostles are dead. All of the disciples in the time of Jesus are dead. At kung may magsasabi sa inyo ngayon that they are apostles, sabi-sabi lang nila yun, but they are not really eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now, because we no longer have eyewitnesses, we are forced to rely on the second piece of evidence, which is the authoritative documents. Or sa amin, tawag namin dyan, these are the documentary exhibits. And now we are pertaining to the written Word of God, which will be the topic or the subject of our sermon today. Introduction lang po pala yun. So ngayon pala magsisimula yung ating first sermon point. So the proposition, the proposition that we have this afternoon is that the Scripture is certain and therefore we can fully trust it. The Scripture is certain and therefore we can fully trust it. And with this proposition, we will have three sermon points. Number one is that the Bible is the Word of God. I know that's too obvious or that is too redundant, but I will explain later why we have to emphasize that the Bible is the Word of God. Second, that the fact that it was delivered through human agency or instrumentality does not make it less divine. And then lastly, that the Bible is without error. Now, let's go to the first point. But before that, let us read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. <coughs> and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. 
to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So that is 2 Peter 1, 19. Palik tayo dun sa question. Why do we have to emphasize that the Bible is the Word of God? It is because without us knowing, or maybe many of us are aware, a lot of Christians or people calling themselves Christians today do not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. That is true. That is shocking. At ano yung pinapaniwalaan nila? Neo-Orthodox theologians like Karl Barth claims that the Bible merely contains the Word of God. Huwag po tayong malito doon. Those are worlds apart different to say that the Bible is the Word of God and the Bible merely contains the Word of God are very different. Ang sinasabi ni na Karl, Karl Barth is that the words of the Scriptures are not inspired. Meron lang doon mga inspired. Yun ang sinasabi nila. And the Bible becomes the Word of God or the event in which God speaks to us through the Bible is the Word of God. Basta ang point nila is, the written word is not actually the Word of God, but the event on which the written word was preached at natouch ka, that is the Word of God. For example, lahat kayo galing sa, hindi lahat, marami sa atin galing sa charismatic at saka sa um, evangelical. Di ba? Di ba ang pinakamalakas na tama ng preaching ay yung bandang dulo na? Kapag yung si pastor ay nasa conclusion na, tapos dapat yung counterpart ni brother mo ay pupunta na sa piano, tapos magkakaroon na ng background music. Tapos kung saan katamaan doon, yung talagang tumago sa puso mo, ang tawag nila doon is nagrema, yung salita ng Diyos. Doon lang nila sasabihin na, the Lord talked to me. And that means to say, yung naunang part ng preaching, hanggang sa nakatulog ka, the Word of God is not talking to you. Because the Word of God only talk to you nung tinamaan ka na. Yun ang sinasabi ni na Karl Barth. That the Word of God is dependent on our experience. It is subjective. At hindi siya nakadepende doon sa nakasulat talaga sa salita ng Diyos. But this view of the inspiration of the Scriptures is foreign to Apostle Peter, who regarded all of the page pages of the Scriptures as inspired by God. But before that, sige, balikan natin yung text. Ang sabi ni Apostle Peter dito is that, and we have the prophetic word. He started to introduce the documentary exhibit. At ang sabi niya dun is prophetic word. Now, baka isipin nyo, oh, Brother Ed, ang sinasabi lang dito ay prophetic word. Hindi naman sinabi dito na the whole Bible. Ibig sabihin, yung mga prophecy, sa, prophecy lang sa loob ng Bible, yun lang ang inspired. Well, that is wrong. Why? Because, pag binasa natin yung Bible, we can see it time and time again that the general designation of the Word of God or the Scripture as a whole is the Law and the Prophets. Okay? Hindi kailangan sabihin ng Bible na the Bible para maintindihan natin the Bible. But sometimes it's also called the Law and the Prophets. And Jewish writers also pertains to the Scriptures as the Law only. So pag nabasa niya yung the Law, it could also pertain to the Old Testament Scripture or the prophets only. Anyhow, ang point dito is, in the way that the word prophetic word was used in this text, it actually pertains to the whole Old Testament Scriptures and not only to the prophetic parts only that is pertaining to the Messiah. At kung titignan natin sa verse 20 and 21, yung mga words na ginamit ni Apostle Paul ay, Apostle Peter rather, ay prophetic word, prophecy of the scriptures, and prophecy. Those three terms are used interchangeably, but it is understood that what they, what they meant is the scriptures as a whole. Now, for our consideration this afternoon, the Greek word that was used in verse 20, para dun sa translation ng the prophecy of the scripture, is the Greek word graphe. Okay? Pag sinabi natin graphe, it means it is something that has been written down. It is something that has been written down. So here we can see that the Peter's view of the inspiration is not only limited to a spoken prophecy, so hindi lang kailangan yung na-preach at nung na-preach ay tinamaan ka, but it also includes those written, written in the pages of the scriptures. Now, ang sabi dito is that 
And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Anong ibig sabihin ng more fully confirmed? Ang ibig sabihin nito is that the prophetic word is an evidence of the second coming of Christ. But this evidence was fully confirmed or supported, or in legal term, it was corroborated by the eyewitness testimony of Apostle Paul, uh, Apostle Peter, and that is his account of the transfiguration. So, sinasabi niya na, this prophetic word is something that we can trust. But because of our eyewitness of what happened in the Mount of Transfiguration, we can see that the scriptures is more sure. That's why, that's why our title for today is Something More Sure, not Something More Sure. Hindi. Something More Sure. So because the scriptures was corroborated by the apostles and it becomes more sure as, an, as a witness to the parusha or the second coming of Christ. Now, the scriptures here is also described as something which we will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the darkness. At alam po natin, when we read the scriptures, it's not new. It's not a new comparison that the scriptures is compared to a lamp that is shining in the darkness. And the reason for that comparison is because the scriptures and the lamp sometimes, or not sometimes, have the same function. At ano po ba yung function na yun? The lamp brings light into the darkness. And the scripture as well brings light into the darkness. But if the scripture is the light, then what is the darkness? Kailangan nating kumpletuhin yung analogy. The darkness here is the ignorant minds of the people. Kasi may kita natin that there will be a contrast between darkness and the coming dawn of the day. So magkakaroon mamaya ng coming dawn of the day where the morning star will arise in our hearts. So may kita nyo, may gabi at may umaga. Yung umaga, this is an eschatological age wherein everything will be revealed to us. And that will happen in the second coming of Christ. But before the coming of that new eschatological age, before the coming of that daybreak, we are still in the darkness. And that darkness is the age of ignorance. Dahil wala tayong kaalam-alam sa plano ng Diyos, wala tayong kaalam-alam sa kung sino talaga si Jesus Christ, at ang tanging guide natin para malaman ang mga bagay na ito ay ang scripture. That's why the scripture is the lamp in the darkness. And because the mind of ignorant people, ignorant in the word of God, is darkened, they also have no hope. Kaya yung mga taong walang alam sa salita ng Diyos, sila yung madalas na biktima ng depression. Although I'm not saying that Christians are immune from depression. What I'm saying is, mas, kumbaga mas, <coughs> tawag dito? Mas, uh, ano nga yun yung, nasa, nasa ano na dila ko eh. Mas prone, okay? Mas prone sa depression ang mga ignorant sa salita ng Diyos because they don't have promises that they can hold on to. Ang akala nila, the life here and now is what it is. At if your life is suffering, wala nang kasunod pa. But if we know the, promise of the promises of the scriptures, if we know the promises of the gospel, the second coming of Christ, we have hope in our hearts. And it is the scriptures that serves as the light in the darkness. It is the lamp in the darkness that raises a ray of hope in the mind of ignorant people. And yun yan, nasabi ko kanina, ang sabi doon sa 2 Peter is that, and we have this prophetic word more fully confirmed to which we do well to pay attention as a lamp, lamp shining in the darkness until the day of the day dawns, and that is the new eschatological age of full revelation, and the morning star rises in our hearts. Now let's focus a little bit on that phrase, the morning star rises in our hearts. Okay, the morning star pertains actually to the planet Venus, which is not a star. Alam naman natin yun, the planet Venus is not a star, it is a planet. However, kapag tumingin ka sa kalangitan, it is as if siya yung pinakamaliwanag na star sa heaven. At yung planet Venus, madalas ay nag-a-appear siya 
at dawn sa madaling araw. Kumbaga, ito yung hudyat ng daybreak. Ito yung hudyat ng pag-uumaga. Yun yung tinatawag natin na morning star. So, the morning star here, it's, it's not the sun. Okay? Although we know, kasi yung anak ko, baka pilosopohin ako, but dad, the sun is also a star in the solar system, right? Ah, ganun din ako ng anak ko. Pero, hindi yun ganun, ice, makinig ka. Uh, <laughs> so, the morning star here is the planet Venus. At ano pa yung sinisignify ng morning star? The morning star is actually an allusion to numbers 24-7. Yung numbers 24-7, ang sabi po, sabi po dito, a star, a star shall rise out of Jacob. And that is a prophecy for the coming Messiah. The morning star is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. At mababasa rin natin sa Revelation 22-16. Ang sabi dito, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So Jesus Christ is the morning star. He is the star that appears in the morning, that accompanies the glimmering of the morning. Kasi siya yung hudyat nung eschatological age wherein everything will be revealed to the people of God. So meaning to say, Brother Ed, ano yung tinutukoy natin dito na the dawning of the day where the morning star will arise in our hearts. It's none other than the second coming of Christ. Because the second coming of Christ, when Christ appears, Christ will be like the morning star at siya yung hudyat ng pag-uumaga wherein everything will be revealed to the people of God. So this is the parusha. This is the second coming of Christ. But, 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 tatanungin nyo, Brother Ed, sa dulo niyan, may nakalagay na the morning star will rise in our hearts. Hindi ba kapag nilagay natin yung last term na yun doon, mababago yung meaning? At baka we are talking to an individual enlightenment experience that will be experienced in the heart and not really about the second coming of Christ. Well, not so fast. Kasi ang totoo, we are still talking about the second coming of Christ, but we all know that Christ will only rise as a morning star in our hearts if you are a believer when the second coming of Christ happened. Tama ba? Because sabi nga ni Paul Washer, I have a good news and a bad news. But it will be a good news or a bad news to you depending on what side you are. The news is that Jesus Christ is coming. Now, if you are a non-believer, that is a bad news for you. If you are a believer, that is a good news for you. Now, yung sinasabi ni Apostle Peter dito is the aspect of the coming of Christ on the believer's side. Wherein, when Jesus Christ comes to us, at kasama nun is the full revelation of the will of God, it will not only happen through, or will not only be conceived through our external senses, but it will also happen to us internally, in our hearts, which will never happen to unbelievers. It will only happen to believers, to the elect. So therefore, the rising of the morning star in the hearts of the believers also pertains to the second coming of Christ. Medyo masyado tayong napasarap sa exposition ng text na yon, pero kailangan natin bumalik doon sa ating point na pinuprove, which is the word, the Bible is the word of God. Okay, sa hinabahaba na explain mo, Brother Ed, paano ka nakaabot sa conclusion that the Bible is the word of God? It is because when Apostle Peter was explaining about the authoritative document that the Word of God is the lamp in the darkness until the day of dawn comes and the morning star arises in our hearts, he is not pertaining to specific parts of the Scriptures. But he is pertaining to his Scriptures as a whole. That's why I made it clear from the very beginning that the term prophetic word or the prophecy of the scriptures or the prophecy pertains not to specific parts of the scriptures but to the scriptures as a whole. When the Apostle, Paul, uh, Apostle Peter referred to the scriptures as an authoritative document to prove the second coming of Christ, he's pertaining to the whole of the scriptures. The authority of God's word resides in the written text. The words, the sentences, the, paragra the paragraphs of the scriptures, not merely in our existential experience of the truth in our hearts. 
Now, kanina pa ako nabubulol ng nabubulol imbis na nasasabi ko si Apostle Peter, nasasabi ko si Apostle Paul. Okay? So, banggitin na natin si Apostle Paul since kanina ko pa siya nababanggit. Even Apostle Paul acknowledged that the inspiration of the entire scripture, uh, that the inspiration is of the entire it's, it's scripture and not some parts of it. Mababasa natin yan sa 2 Timothy 3.16 which says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So ano raw yung breathed out by God? Is it some of the scriptures? O yun lang bang part ng scriptures na nagrema sa'yo? No! It is all of the scriptures is breathed out by God. And furthermore, even Christ claimed that God inspired the Bible's letters and words. We can see that in Matthew 5, 17 to 18 when Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, not until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In these verses, Jesus said that He came to fulfill every detail which God's Word has promised about Him. Don't stop part na, not the smallest letter. In other translations, ang ginamit na term ay, even the smallest jots or tittle. Yun yung sa Hebrew, sa Hebrew language, pinag-uusapan namin kahapon. Sabi ni Brother Rowell, mas mahirap daw aralin ang Hebrew language visually. Kasi parang pare-parehas. And then meron doong character na parang kuwit lang na ganun. Ang sabi ni Jesus Christ, even yung kuwit na ganun, yung jot and tittle will not perish, will not disappear until everything has been accomplished. At ang pinapakita lang natin dito is that Jesus <coughs> or God remembers the smallest detail of what he inspired even the smallest jot and tittle christ came to fulfill even the smallest detail of what the old testament scripture said about him this demonstrates jesus commitment to what we call the verbal inspiration of the scriptures now i'm going to present two theological terms again yung tinatawag natin na verbal inspiration of the scriptures and the plenary inspiration of the scriptures which we will contrast or we will um, contradict with the limited or the partial inspiration of the scriptures. Pag sinabi natin yung verbal inspiration of the scriptures, tulad ng sinasabi ni Jesus Christ, that everything in the scriptures, mapaletter yan, mapakwit yan, mapasentence para, paragraph yan, all of them are inspired. Every word, every symbol are inspired. But, let me give a caveat. Ang inspired ay yung original language. Hindi po inspired yung translation. Kaya po, itong mga Bible na binabasa natin ngayon, yung ESV, those are not inspired translations. Well, there's no such thing as an inspired translation. May inspired scriptures, but we are referring to the original language. That's why we are compelled as preachers and teachers of the Word of God to always refer back to the original language. Because what is authoritative is the original language and not the translations. Kahit na gano'ng kaganda pa yung translation na yan, it's not inspired. So that is verbal inspiration. And the plenary inspiration is that God inspired the totality of the scriptures. So, kumbaga, walang kawala. Walang kawala sa inspiration. Up to the smallest detail, up to the totality of the scriptures, all of them is inspired by God. That is the view of Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, and Jesus Christ himself. Which should be contrasted with limited or partial inspiration. Na pinuput forward ng mga neo-Orthodox theologians, ng mga progressive Christians, or ng mga liberals na sinasabi nila, hindi naman lahat yan nasa scriptures ay inspired. Kasi yung iba dyan ay fantasies, mga fairy tales. That is not how we should look at the scriptures. We should look at the scriptures the way the apostles in our Lord Jesus Christ look at the scriptures. Now let's go to the second point. The Bible is given through human instrumentalities but does not make it less divine. Now let's read 2 Peter 
21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was never produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, kanina, na-discuss natin that the Gnostics or the false teachers are attacking the parousia or the second coming of Christ. Nang sa ganun, mawalan ng motivation ang mga believers to ignore wickedness and to pursue godliness. But that is not the only thing that the false teachers attacked. But they also attack the validity of our expectation. Uh, no, sorry. They are also attack the accuracy of the Old Testament prophecies. They attack the accuracy of the Old Testament prophecies. And they did that in two ways. Okay? The first is that they attack the origin of the prophecies. Sinasabi nila na, hindi, mga prophecy na yan, those are of human origins. And the second way they attacked it is that they said na, yes, your prophets may have had visions or dreams, but their interpretation of those, those dreams and visions are not inspired. It's as if they are saying na, okay, mga prophets nyo nakakita ng ulap, nakakita ng mga angels, but how about the interpretation of that? Yung interpretation nila dyan are mere guesswork or arbitrary. That's why, kahit pagbalibalik na rin natin yan, you cannot trust the scriptures. Yun ang sinasabi ng mga false teachers. But that is not the teaching of the scriptures. Because, aside from the visions and the dreams being inspired, even the interpretations of the prophets of what they saw are inspired. That is why we can really put our trust in the scriptures. So, ang sabi dito, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Meaning to say, prophecies did not come from human initiative or from human imagination. Hindi po ito katulad ng mga prophets ngayon, na not to, not to um, like, ridicule them. Pero, sorry kung may kita nyo, ang laki ng trauma ko po, di ba, sa charismatic. Kasi parang nag-training ako dyan eh. And we are even trained to prophesy. At ang kailangan mo lang gawin is ipikit mo lang ang mata mo kung ano yung na-imagine mo, yun na yun, prophecy na yun. Tapos hanapan mo ng meaning. Now, if that is the way in which the prophecy is done, then that is really not trans trans trustworthy. Because that kind of prophecy is based on man's initiative. Kasi sinabi sa'yo, oh, sige, mag-imagine ka. O di in-initiate mo yun. Then, it is also based on man's imagination. But it's, that's not the way God gave His prophecy to, its, to His prophets. But God gave them the message. God gave them the vision and the images and the dreams. And then God gave them the interpretation. That is the way God gave them those prophecies. And then, ang sabi dito is that these holy men and women, women of God, they are carried along by the Spirit. That's why they were able to produce the Scriptures. Now, let's focus on that term. They, would, they were carried along. They were carried by the Holy Spirit. So, papaano nga ba kineri ng Holy Spirit ang mga human agents or human instrumentality in order to come up with the Scriptures? Now, with this topic, we have to touch the three views on the inspiration of the scriptures. And what are these three views? Number one is the mechanical view on the inspiration of the scripture. Number two is the dynamic view on the inspiration. And number three is the organic view on inspiration. Mabis lang to. Uh, explain ko agad. Pag sinabi natin mechanical view of inspiration, ang ginawa ni God is ginikta niya sa mga tao yung isusulat na para bang, parang ano, parang sinapian yung tao or may bumubulong dun sa tao such that every word, as in everything, every sentence, every, every figure na isusulat niya, all came from God. At walang contribution whatsoever yung agent of revelation. Yun yung mechanical view of inspiration. In this view, the scriptures is inspired but the agent or the instrumentality or the writer is not inspired. Yun po yun. The second is the dynamic view of inspiration. So, dynamic view of inspiration naman, ang ginawa is the Holy Spirit inspired the author tapos nung inspired the inspired na yung author, nagsulat yung author. 
Pero hindi ibig sabihin no, na guided yung author is strictly to the point na hindi siya magiging errant or fallible. Parang ang nangyari is that he nightened ng Holy Spirit yung spirituality ng author at yung human intellect ng author at nang sa ganun nakapag-produce siya ng isang article. Ganun siya. But in this view, may kita natin that the author is inspired but the text is not. Kasi kapag ganun ang view na susundan natin is we cannot say that the scriptures is devoid of errors or anything wrong. And the last view which the Reformed faith holds on to is the organic view of inspiration. So organic view of inspiration is that meron tayong tinatawag na dual authorship of the scripture. Wherein the Holy Spirit guides the agent of revelation but at the same time the agent of revelation retains his educational background, his temperament, his style in writing, his culture, and his uh, and everything about him. That's why may kita natin sa scripture, pag nagbasa tayo, alam mo, halata mo na iba-iba yung nagsulat nun. Di ba? Kasi kapag ang binabasa mo, Book of Mark, lagi yung immediately, 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 hanggang sa dulo, hingal ka na eh. Kasi puro immediately. Pag kay Apostle Paul naman yan, ah, parang ayaw gumamit ng period. Parang yung isang sentence ni Apostle Paul, isang paragraph yun. Ganun siya, kubaga, ganun siya ka complicated. At kapag si Luke naman ang nagsulat, alam mong detail. Kasi, ano yun eh, doctor slash historian yun. May mo na iba-iba talaga yung nagsulat. And th this is what we say by the Holy Spirit carried them along. It means that the Holy Spirit acted on the writers of the Bibles in an organic way, in harmony with the laws of their own inner being, using them just as they were, that their character, their temperament, their gifts and talents, their education, their culture, their vocabulary, and their style. The Holy Spirit illumined their minds, aided their memory, prompted them to write, repressed their influence of their sin on their writings, and guided them in the expression of their thoughts, even to the choice of their words. In other words, Kapag yung view natin is the organic view, the author is inspired and the text is inspired. Yun ang pinakaiba. Ulitin ko lang po ah. Sa mechanical view, the author is not inspired but the text is inspired. Sa dynamic view, the author is inspired but the text is not. But in organic view, the author and the text are both inspired. And what we hold on to is the organic view of the inspiration of the scriptures. The Bible is in one sense a human and a divine book. But it, this is in no way implies any fallibility in the scriptures. The dual authorship of the scriptures does not necessitate imperfection any more than the two natures of Christ means our Savior must have seen. Okay? In the same way na si Jesus Christ is dual in nature, he is both God and man, pero hindi siya nagkasala. There is no imperfection in Him. That is the same way in our scriptures. Our scriptures is both written by man and God, but it doesn't mean that it is imperfect at that we can find any errors in the scriptures. That, why, that is why we can fully trust the Word of God, even though it was given to us through human agencies and human instrumentalities. And lastly, let me go to my last point. The Bible is without error. The purpose of this last point, <coughs> the purpose of this last point is not to answer all of the alleged errors or contradictions or inconsistencies in the Bible. Hindi ko po, wala po akong listahan dito ng mga contradictions at ng mga errors sa Bible at sasagutin ko lahat-lahat. Kasi kapag ginawa po natin yon sa next Lord's Day na po tayo matatapos. Okay po? But one thing is for sure, one thing is for sure, all of those allegations of errors, inconsistencies, and faults in the Bibles, in the Bible were all answered. They were all answered. In fact, I challenge you, kung meron kayong tanong about the scriptures, about inconsistencies in the scriptures, type it in Google, and the Google will, will answer you back. Why? Bakit ganun siya? Because these questions are not really new. Paulit-ulit na po itong mga claims about the inconsistencies and errors of the in the scriptures, and they have been answered. They, are, they have been answered centuries ago pa. Pero, ang ginagawa kasi ng mga kalaban ng scriptures is that, even though their objections has been already answered, 
answer, they will, they will still circulate it kasi alam nila na meron at merong Christian dyan na mahina ang palalampalataya at tamad mag-research, nakakagat doon sa alleged error or inconsistencies in the scriptures. Alam niyo po ba itong mga alleged errors and inconsistencies in the scriptures are like fake news? They are like fake news. Kasi kung may kita niyo po, yung mga peddlers ng fake news sa social media, kahit ilang beses mo sagutin yan, kahit na maubos na yung oras mo dyan, yung, yung, five to, yung 8 to 5 mo sa work, ibinuhos e mo na sa pagsagot ng mga trolls at ng mga nagpapakalat ng fake news, hindi hindi po yan mauubos. Why? Because I believe that their main goal is not really to take down the scriptures. Why? Because our enemies are not foolish. They are not stupid. They have known from experience in the past centuries ago how many times they have tried to destroy the scriptures and they did not win. Because they know that God is committed to preserve and uphold the scriptures. Kaya kahit na ano gawin nilang paninila sa scriptures, they cannot destroy the scriptures. So kung hindi nila kayang i-take down ng scriptures, anong i-take down nila? Ang i-take down nila ay yung mga Christians na may hina ang pananampalataya. Kasi meron at meron diyang makakakita ng mga tanong na to na hindi malang mag-research. At the moment na makita nila yun, ay, wala pala eh. Yung scriptures pala maraming mali. di ba? That's why hindi tayo dapat mawalan ng, kumbaga, hindi tayo mawalan ng gana na i-defend ang scriptures. Actually, the answers to these questions are just one Google away because there are really answers to these questions. Now, aside from the fact that uh, aside from the fact that every one of these alleged errors has been answered, we can be sure that the Bible is without error because after all, tulad nga po nandiniscuss natin kanina, the Bible is the Word of God. And because it is written by an infallible being, the Holy Spirit Himself, therefore it follows that the Bible does not contain any errors. And that is a simple logic. And even for the prophets, not only are their visions and dreams given to them inspired, but also their interpretations of it are inspired. Because God is still carrying them even in their interpreting of what they have seen. That's why there are really rooms for error in the writing. Of the scriptures. Now, some Christians may deny the inerrancy of the scriptures not because they want to attack the scriptures, but because they want to relieve themselves of the burden of constantly defend, de defending the scriptures. Meron po mga grupo ng Christian na ganun eh, na pagod na pagod na silang i-defend ang scriptures. Kaya ang ginawa na lang nila, o oh, sige mga kapatid, isurrender na natin itong isang part ng battle line. Pagod na kami, o oh, sige, let's have a truce. Okay? As long as the gospel is correct, as long as the message of salvation is correct, okay, payag na kami, the details are not all correct. So, ganun ang nagiging compromise. But actually, that is a fool's bargain. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Akala ba natin na kapag hinayaan natin sa mga kalaban ng scriptures na, sige, kunin nyo na yung inerrancy of the scriptures is that tatantanan nila tayo? hindi nila tayo tatanan. But actually, that is the beginning of the downfall of the whole message. Because as what I've said a while ago, the claims of Christianity are rooted on historicity. Now, if it's no longer rooted on historicity, then saan siya nakabase? Di po ba? Kung sasabihin natin, okay, the gospel, is, the gospel message is correct, but the details of the Bible is not correct. Okay, saan ngayon nakabase yung message of the Bible? sa nakabase, nakabase yung message of the gospel. Wala, di po ba? Tignan nyo. We believe as Christians that we are saved by the perfect work of Jesus Christ when He died on the cross. Paano ko sabihin sa atin ng mga skeptics na, eh paano kung di na naman accurate yung detail na namatay talaga siya? Di ba? Paano kung yung detail na yun is one of the errors in the scriptures? Or, what if um, hindi accurate yung detail na si Jesus Christ ay galing pala talaga sa line of Judah. Ay, line of Benjamin pala talaga siya. Hindi naman natin masasabi. Kasi the scriptures is not really accurate, hindi po ba? Ganun ang mangyayari. 
Ang mangyayari po dyan, if we will give up the details of the scriptures, it is like we have given up the message of the gospel itself. Because the message of the gospel is based on these details. It is based on historicity. At kung i-give up natin to, it's like we are risking winning the battle at the risk of losing the war. It's, it, it's as if we are winning the battle at the risk of losing the war. Now, inerrancy basically means that the Word of God always stands over us and we never stand over the Word of God. Kasi kapag giniva po natin yung inerrancy ng scriptures at sasabihin natin, sige, merong mga parts ng scriptures na hindi totoo. Ang sunod na tanong dyan, sino ang magdedetermine ng mga parts ng scriptures na hindi totoo? Sino? Hindi ba tayo? So, ang mangyayari dyan is, sino na ngayon ang mas, mas mataas sa scriptures? Tayo na. Kasi pwede tayong mamili anytime kung aling part ng scriptures ang tatanggalin natin. And because we have the simple nature, ang lagi natin tatanggalin dyan is yung mga inconvenient sa atin. Like for example, gusto mo maging pastora, di ba? E sabi nga sa Bible, bawal ang pastora. Sabi mo, ay, full of errors naman yung scriptures eh. At ang isa sa errors dyan ay yung sinabi ni Apostle Paul na bawal magpastor ang pastora. And in that way, we negate the scriptures. And we put ourselves as judge of the scriptures instead of the scriptures judging us. This kind of compromise does not express a proper submission to the Father and does not work for our joy in Christ and do not bring honor to the Spirit who carried along men to speak the prophetic word and to author the holy book. And now let's go to our application. Now that we know that the Scriptures is inspired and the Scriptures is the Word of God and not merely contains the Word of God, our application as believers is that we must approach the Scriptures with reverence. We must approach the Scriptures with reverence. Before kasi, dahil ang thinking natin, eh, di naman lahat yan, is Word of God, malakas ang loob tayo, malakas ang loob natin to always quote, misquote, misinterpret the Word of God. Because we don't feel burdened by the fact that we are using the very words of God kapag ina-advance natin yung mga sarili nating agenda. That's why not only teachers or preachers should learn how to exegete the text or the Word of God, but even members who are sitting here right now, you should be able to know as well how to exegete the Word of God. Because what we are handling is something that is divine. Lalo na kapag nag-share kayo sa mga kamag-anak nyo, sa mga friends nyo, hindi pwedeng quote lang tayo ng quote, quote ng quote. Diba? Laging bugbog na bugbog sa atin yung Jeremiah 29.11 eh. Kasi hindi natin alam yung totoong meaning nun. So we have to know how to execute, we have to approach the Word of God with reverence. And since we know that the authority of God's Word resides in the written text, and that the inspiration of the Scriptures is an objective reality outside us, let us go to the Word of God and not seek any more special revelations from Him outside the Bible. Okay po ba? Huwag na po tayong maghanap ng special revelation. Okay? Kasi nandito naman sa atin yung revealed Word ni God. Di ba nga ang sabi sa Jeremiah, ay Jeremiah, sa Deuteronomy 29.29, The secret things of God belongs to our Lord, our God. But the revealed things of God belongs to us and our children forever so that we may be able to obey His commandments. Yun po ang purpose. That's why we have to know the will of God is so that we will be able to follow His will and His commandments. Ganito po kasi yan nangyayari. Minsan, hin hinahanap natin yung special personal revelation ni God not because the Bible is silent about our problems and our circumstances. Totoo po yan. Hindi po yan dahil sa, ay, hinanap ko naman kasi yung Bible, brother Ed, pero wala kasi talaga akong makitang swak dun sa aking problema eh. That is not true. Most of the time, the Bible has answers to all of our problems or our dilemmas in life. But the truth of the matter is that the reason why we are looking for special revelation is because we are looking for a second opinion. That is true. Totoo po yan. Kasi, like halimbawa, ito, very, very, ano to, very specific. Pag tayo po, nainda po tayo sa unbeliever, hindi po ba? Eh, uh, brother Ed, siya na talaga eh. Pero alam mo naman, di ba, na do not be 
equally yoked with unbeliever. So, nakalagay na yun sa scriptures. Ngayon, sasabihin mo ba sa akin na, hindi, hindi kasi malinaw yung nakasulat sa scriptures. Kaya, kailangan ko munang marinig yung still small voice ni God. Kasi baka sabihin ni God sa akin, siya na yan, anak. Ganun po ba yun? As if God will contradict what is written in His Word. Isa pang reason why we are asking for a special personal revelation is because we are not really after knowing how to obey the Word of God. But we are after knowing what providence is giving us in the future. Ang gusto po talaga nating mangyari is not how to know the Word of God, to obey God, but how to be a manghuhula in the future. Yun po ang gusto nating mangyari. Like, di ba, doon niya sa nagkakagusto sa unbeliever. Sabi niyan, oh brother Ed, lakas na loob mong makasabi na huwag kang maequally yoke sa unbeliever. Eh, nung napangasawa mo si Sister Cheryl, di ba unbeliever yan? Oh, yun. Oh, di ba providence yan? Oo, providence nga yun. Hindi ko naman sinasabing tama ako, di ba? Sinasabi ko, mali din ako doon. Pero the point of searching the scriptures is not so that we will know what providence has for us in store. But the purpose of knowing the scriptures is so that we will know how to obey the word of God. Yun nga yung nakasulat sa Jeremiah, sa Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things of God belongs to the Lord. But the revealed wings belongs to us and to our children forever. Not so that we will know what providence provides, but so that we can humble ourselves and obey the word of God. So it's not about being a manghuhula, ladies and gentlemen. Huwag na po natin pangarapin na hulangan ang mangyayari sa in the future. Dahil kahit na providence yung nangyayari sa amin ni Sister Sheryl, I know that I have sinned in that part. At wala naman po siguro mga kapagsabi dito na in-encourage ko kayo na mag-asawa kayo ng unbeliever. Hindi ko po sasabihin sa inyo. Oh, that may be providence, but I know that that is against the Word of God. Pero wala po akong pagsisisi sa nangyari sa aking buhay. Okay, sabi niya po ni John Owen, If private revelations agree with Scripture, they are needless. And if they disagree, they are false. So there is really no need for us to look for private revelation. Because if it agrees with the scriptures, edi, alam mo na yun. It agrees with the scriptures nga eh. And if it does not agree with the scriptures, then that is false. And then, lastly, we must defend the doctrine of the inerrancy of the scriptures from people who hold to neo-orthodox theology, progressive Christianity, and liberalism. Let us not give up the doctrine of the inerrancy of the scriptures dahil kapag ginawa po natin yan, doon na po magsisimulang mawasak yung buong message. And lastly, as a call for unbelievers. Since the Bible is the word of God and it does not contain any errors, unbelievers should consider what the scripture says about them. If the Bible is the word of God, then totoo yung sinasabi ng scriptures that we are all sinners. And that unless we put our faith in Jesus Christ, all we can expect in the future is judgment and damnation. That's why, again, the call for unbelievers is that we should repent and put our faith in Christ because that is what the Word of God says. And as a conclusion, CCRC Imus, since God's Word is sure, we can totally depend on it and trust it as a guide in all the areas of our lives. So let us all come to the Word of God with reverence and awe and acknowledge that His Word is above us and not the other way around. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that we are not the judge of your word, but it is your word that will judge us. And we know that the incarnate word will come again in the future in all of his glory to judge the living and the dead. We thank you, God, for reminding us that we can trust the scriptures because the scriptures is your word. And the fact that is given to us through human agency and instrumentality does not make it less divine. And it is without error because you are the author of your word. So Father, we pray that you give us the faith to rely on your word, to not question it, but to immerse, to immerse ourselves in your words and to always conform ourselves to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.